Right. Well, I think we're live. Um, so let me say three things by way of preamble. Um, firstly, welcome. Uh, it's always lovely to see, uh, albeit virtually, so many of you join us for this exciting uh, post-budget uh, webinar where we'll run through what on earth has been going on. Uh, secondly, uh, my name is David Ellis. Uh, my day job, I suppose, is a partner at BDO. I look after things to do with pay for clients, but I'm here really in their capacity, I suppose, just to welcome you and to host the session today because I have a wonderful lineup of speakers for you to take you through what has been going on. So very quickly before we dive into the detail, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Nina Scarrow from CEBR. Um, who will be running through the macro impact of the budget today, um, which uh, I, I really do urge you to listen to. There's some fascinating content in there. Uh, my fellow partner, Ben Hanley, is joining us. Ben looks after uh, private wealth, uh, high net worth, any any form of words uh, to avoid saying rich people, I think, if truth be known. He's on mute, so he can't answer anyway. Uh, my colleague, Caroline Harwood, who will be looking after Anything to do with employer and employee taxes, um, the tiny subsection of the population who are hardworking people, I think, is the common phrase we use these days. And Ed Gibson, who's looking after business taxes. No jokes there. And Aditi Hyatt, who will be covering VAT. Um, incomprehensible, though it always is to me. Um, we will... Uh, be with you for an hour today. We're desperately hoping that we will finish on time. So we will hold people to the to the time they have to speak. And we will have a couple of uh, opportunities at the end for Q&A. Um, please post any questions you might have uh, in the Q&A um, through the Zoom app. And I will have a look at them as we go through and pick a selection for our esteemed panel to answer. I will genuinely try and pick the hardest ones to provide them with the most challenge. So please ask them with that view in light. Um, let us crack on. So if it is OK, I would like to hand over to Nina, who is going to kick us off. Um, welcome, Nina, and let's go. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to join the, the BDO experts for another year of budgetary analysis. Uh, a lot to cover in 10 minutes. So rather than delve into any one specific budget announcement, I'm primarily going to use that time to sort of to discuss the overall economic narrative that we've been presented with by the chancellor and the impact that that overall has on the economic outlook and our forecasts. So Looking at the budget at a glance, um, the state will now be much larger than it was due to be. So if we go to the next slide just for a second, this is what I mean by that. So if we look at public spending as a share of GDP and we look at that gap between the bright green line, which is the current projections following yesterday's announcements compared to the darker line, which was the, the expectations before yesterday's event, by the end of parliament, that gap there is about five percentage points. And then similarly on taxes as a share of GDP, that gap is about a full percentage point. So it's a true sort of classic sort of core of labor party ideology style budget in a sense that the state is getting much, much larger. So if we can click back for a moment. Um, the government did avoid spooky markets. Um, it's been a pretty benign reaction uh, across the board, and despite the, the significant increase in spending. And the reason for that is that they've presented corresponding tax increases to finance that spending. So we didn't sort of see the same significant tremors in the mini budget, um, where a lot of the issue came around the fact that the, these the, this expenditure was um, unfunded. Um, some of the more extreme policy announcements that were rumored in the lead up to the budget didn't end up materializing things like matching the CGT rate to the higher rate of income tax, uh, continuing the fiscal drag even beyond the 28-29 when it's currently set to end. Now, there is a chance that these rumors were a little bit of sort of 
political strategy and that it was the Labour Party themselves that was leaking this information so that there was a sense of relief no matter what they actually announced. But nonetheless, we didn't see some of the more extreme announcements that were discussed. Probably the biggest, meatiest thing that came out of the budget yesterday as anticipated was the change to employer NICs, which on its own is going to rise more, raise more than half that headline 40 billion um, taxation figure. Um, and that in itself makes up more than makes up for the revenue loss from the drop in employee NICs at the last two fiscal events. So I will come on to that in a moment because that was sort of economically speaking, the really, really big um, announcement. So if we click ahead to slides, please. There we are. Um, so along with this narrative, which is basically we're taxing more, uh, we are cutting expenditure in the immediate future because we've inherited this really bad position from the previous government. And then further down the line, we're going to be getting an investment boost and that's going to lead to growth. So that's sort of the overall narrative. Now, I can see a number of risks to that narrative. And in the spirit of Halloween, in case not everybody is already very sick of all the Halloween puns in the press, I've decided to rate these risks on a ghost uh, scale, three ghosts being the more severe risks, one ghost being milder risks. So starting with a three ghost category, um, the scale of tax increase is clearly going to, to hurt growth. But we're seeing that in CBR's forecast, we're seeing that in the OBR projections across a broad spectrum of private sector forecasters. And I'll come on to that in a moment, but it is a fine balance, basically how much growth to sacrifice for the sake of hiking taxes. And this is definitely a budget that's taking a bit of a chance on how much growth can be sacrificed. The second three ghost uh, risk is public sector productivity targets, which, and I appreciate this can seem counter, uh, counterintuitive, but they're on the one hand, both overly modest yet unachievable. So the idea that is the plan that is baked into the government's fiscal projection is that they're going to gain about 2% annually in public sector productivity. Uh, now we've lost uh, about a fifth, about 20% during COVID. So recovering 2% per year is actually quite modest. On the other hand, pre-COVID growth was at around 1% a year. So I just didn't really see materially how they're actually going to generate even this amount of productivity improvements that still wouldn't be enough. So basically, long story short, I think there needs to be a much more substantial plan on what to do with productivity across the economy, but particularly in this context in the public sector. Now, moving on to the two ghost risks, um, reaction of international investors to CGT hikes and loss of non-DOM status. Of course, OBR and the government's projections do bake in some changes in behavior, but I wonder if they have slightly underestimated the extent to which individuals and businesses are going to alter, uh, alter their behavior in a light of these changes. And then also employer NICs feeding into higher inflation. Um, I'll come on to the mechanism for that uh, in a moment, but it de definitely is a budget that uh, risks being somewhat inflationary at a time when we've only just left an inflationary spiral. So that was my second two ghost uh, risk. And then finally, um, you, you see there a list of uh, relatively small misses of target that would mean that the chancellor has lost all of her headroom against her fiscal targets. But I've categorized that as only a one ghost risk because, uh, well, basically these are self-imposed targets as we've seen over and over again, the government can sort of fiddle them essentially. Um, and there is gonna be many fiscal events between now and the end of parliament. So um, it's something to keep in mind, but probably not, not a major one. So moving on, um, I said that the tax rises would come at the expense of growth. And here are our projections. The, the top lighter line um, shows where our forecast was before the, uh, the last fiscal event, which was in March. Um, and you can see that it's been quite cut down quite a lot following yesterday's announcement. This is cumulative growth in the next, in the next five years. 
Um, and we, of course, think that our projections are more realistic than you've seen. OBR's projections have also been cut over that five-year cumulative period, by, but by not as much. And a lot of the underlying difference there is basically the level of sensitivity that's assumed to individuals, to businesses, to global stakeholders as well, in terms of how they're going to respond to UK being a fiscal, fiscally less favorable place to to conduct uh, to conduct business. And then the next slide shows us our annual year by year projection for um, for UK GDP growth, um, which basically is quite modest but accelerating over the next or the forecast horizon in those five years. Now, what you don't see is that in the 2030s and beyond, we do actually expect higher growth, assuming that this higher level of investment is maintained. But also when, when you go that far into the future, your bands of uncertainty become much wider. So that is a big if. If these higher levels of investment are sustained, eventually, uh, assuming you sort of haven't gone into recession in the meantime, you we do expect that eventually you will see the higher growth, assuming you you get to that point with these higher levels of, of investment. And then the next slide, I said I won't delve into any pause into any particular policy in too much detail, because of course that's what's coming from all of BDO's uh, tax experts. Um, but this is an example of uh, an illustrative example of why there is a bit of a difference between our forecasts and the OBR, the watchdog forecasts. I said that there is a different sensitivity analysis to how people and businesses are going to respond to different taxes. So this is our projection of what the impact of the hike in CGT is going to do to overall GDP as businesses either take on less risky behavior because they're now rewarded less for risk taking. Maybe some global businesses don't spend as much in the in the UK. Perhaps some businesses are never formed at all. Businesses that already exist adjust their behavior. So that goes from a relatively modest 0.1 drag on GDP growth in next year. But then assuming this, this framework persists in the next couple of decades, you would see that that accumulates to a much more significant one and a half, nearly one and a half percent uh, drag on GDP growth. Now, looking at uh, the impact on inflation and therefore the bank rate forecast. Um, so we are expecting inflation to hover just above the two percent target and then hit the two percent target in the late 2020s. Um, I think the implication being that the new bank rate normal is around three percent. So I think the budget in that sense solidifies this idea that the era of ultra low interest rates is well and truly behind us, given that the additional spending and also the changes to NICS, which I'll come on to in a second, could definitely be mildly inflationary. Uh, but still, barring any outside shocks, we, of course, wouldn't see expect to see inflation hiking anywhere to the to the spiral we had in the, the couple of years behind us. Um, and now looking at the big announcement on employer NICs. Um, so the the title there is how much of this NICs burden are businesses going to pass on and how can they pass it on? Um, so they could pass it on in terms of less hiring, lower wages. Um, I think that is less likely given where we are with the with the labor market. Labor market is near full employment, unemployment is very low, businesses are still actually struggling to hire the best staff. So somewhat unlikely that that's going to be a major impact. I think the important channel for how this gets passed on to the wider economy is that businesses are going to hike their prices to protect their margin as a result of the higher tax, which then contributes to inflation, um, which feeds into that sort of above inflation forecast that I just showed. Um, now, the, the sort of other side of this NICS announcement from yesterday is that there's going to be an enhancement in the employment allowance. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. And I'm sure this will be very welcome. We're sh showing here a metric that CBR runs with the Federation of Small Businesses, we got, which got mentioned in the budget yesterday as having been advocating for a boost to the employment allowance. Um, and given that small business employment has been trailing uh, employment trends overall recently, I'm sure this will be very welcome. But the only caveat I would give there is that employment allowance, I would say, benefits very small businesses rather than sort of SMEs, as I think the government is somewhat 
suggesting. So it's it's a welcome uh, it's a welcome boost in our relief, but it's only impacting and only helping very very small uh, businesses because that threshold you have to meet to qualify is exceptionally low. So very quickly to sum up. Uh, the near-term growth outlook is very much under downward pressure due to the increase in taxes. Um, but in the 2030s, there is meant to be a boost to growth from the additional investment, with granted with very large bands of uncertainty. Um, the desired outcomes are based on on some very risky assumptions, which I mentioned um, at the at the beginning. So definitely a very very sort of precarious situation um, for the the government uh, going forward. Not much was said yesterday on types of investment that are going to be driving growth. Um, I suppose that the government is still mostly relying on its reform of planning regulation. Um, and all of this means that it will be a tricky few years ahead for households and disposable incomes, given that the government is essentially sacrificing individual incomes for the sake of putting more in the provision of public services in the near term. Thank you very much for that. And with that, I hand it over to Ben. Thank you very much, Nina. Fascinating as ever. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, so the speculation is over. Would there be changes on um, capital gains tax? Would there be changes to inheritance tax? Would there be further details on non-dom reform and so on? Yes, yes to all those. So I've got a nice three-course meal for you this morning. Um, we're going to start off with a nice appetizer of capital gains tax changes and then move on to uh, the main course of IHT and then we'll finish off with some delicious non-dom uh, non reform. So the capital gains rate changes, they, they are what they are. Um, there was some speculation around what the rate would be, whether it would be in mid-year or wait till the 6th of April. So we found out yesterday, and obviously the higher rates moving from, from sales that on or after yesterday, tax at 24% for higher rate taxpayers rather than 20%. So I guess my reflection on that was, well, for everybody, you know, in the run up to this, it's natural to have conversation with clients about what should we be doing, rate changes and so on. I think the consensus was, well, if you are in a transaction and you can do it before the 30th of October, why wouldn't you? Um, it then becomes a harder conversation on speculation. Well, I think those that did push for transactions before the 30th of October will probably be mildly pleased they did so to save the tax. Those that weren't in a position to do so um, hopefully won't be um, too upset by the 24%. And it's good to have some sort of certainty on that moving forward. So the changes, um, the sort of key ones to pull out there are the, the carried interest and the business asset disposal relief moving forward. Um, carried interest, so that is going to go from, for those higher rate um, payers, do carried interest earners pay standard rate? I don't know. But higher rate car uh, carried interest earners will move from 28% currently to 30%, 32% on their carried interest gains from the 6th of April, 25 and then from 6th of April 26, it moves to an income tax regime. So a whole new regime comes out with an effective rate of 34.1%. So I think that's calculated at 72.5% of your income, which comes out at that rate. So that's the headline rate, but there'll be huge amounts of detail and probably um, there's, there's just very different legislation that applies to income tax as opposed to capital gains, uh, different reporting requirements, um, treaties, uh, what you can do with transfers and so on. So I'm sure those in the carried interest world will be um, speaking to their advisors, advisors evidently um, over, over, the, over the coming year or so. And then business asset disposal relief, would it go, would it stay? So it stayed as a one million limit, albeit the rate is going to increase from uh, next year and the year after. So moving from 10% currently, that has stayed with us for this tax year as opposed to the, the standard rate moving. So 10% on, on those assets qualifying for business asset disposal relief um, up to 5th of April 25, 14% on the first one million and 18% and thereafter. So I think the benefit compared to the headline rates in those years is 140,000 benefit uh, for the current year, 100,000 next year and moving to about 60,000 next year, the year after that. So that was CGT changes. That probably makes sense as you look at it today. It's probably something you look back on in two or three years time and say, what was the rate again? Um, so um, there we go. Um, next slide, please. 
So I just wanted to, some other CTT measures which are either changed or, or did not change. So investor relief, in my experience, this hasn't been widely taken up. This was a rule where subscribing for um, new shares and qualifying businesses, I think around March, April 2016, it was seen as a CGT relief, but it had more, more sort of um, overlay with, um, I think, sort of uh, e EIS type investments. Um, that's where qualifying gains, the limit was 10 million um, and taxed at 10 percent. That reduced down just to one million um, from disposals um, uh, on or after yesterday. So disposals to an e employee ownership trust. So they still say, so for those not familiar, um, a sale to an employee ownership trust, a trust for the benefit of employees, where you sell a, uh, a where you sell a controlling interest in a in a qualifying trading business of fifty one percent or more, that is tax free. It goes into the trust, no gain, no loss. Um, that remains, uh, which is positive news. There were some changes to conditions and reporting requirements. Um, uh, which we could sort of uh, can touch upon if your questions, but um, uh, they they still remains a sort of very um, uh, attractive uh, uh, regime and, and benefit for those wishing to move into employee ownership of the businesses. Um, and no change. I just mention it for completeness because there were speculations around CGT uplift to market value on death. You know, would that go? It remains so on death assets are we based to market value for CGT purposes. Would there be a tax imposed on private your private residents? Uh, no, is the answer to that. So next slide, please. So inheritance tax. So this was where I had saw some really big changes, which will be um, of, of, of relevance to a lot of uh, business owners, certainly. Certainly those who trade in businesses who have pre previously uh, qualified for full exemption from inheritance tax. So again, I'm sure people on this audience are familiar, but the inheritance tax relief, business relief and agricultural property relief, um, it does provide um, exemption from inheritance tax effectively for qualifying uh, qualifying assets. So those with shareholdings in unquoted trading businesses, um, there is a full exemption from inheritance tax or has been a full exemption from inheritance tax um, subject to some specific rules and accepted assets and the like. So from 6th of April 2026, that's going to be curtailed somewhat. So from, from the 6th of April 2026, on those qualifying shareholding, I'm going to keep it simple, got a shareholding and trading business. The first 1 million is going to be exempt, so it's currently unlimited, and then 50% relief thereafter. So if you look at some simple numbers, if I've got a business worth £10 million today, the exemption for high HT is total. Um, from 6th of April, if I, were to, if I were to die out of my £10 million business, I've got an IHT liability of £1.8 million. So again, this, whether this will lead to um, sort of changes um, in, in, in how we uh, hold things, uh, uh, pass them down generations and so on, uh, maybe more people will be thinking about insurance to pay for IHT liabilities, maybe instalments for 10 years where businesses are, are passed down and needing time to sort of pay the inheritance tax liability. We'll say that um, trusts are similarly going to have their um, uh, going to have similar provisions apply. So again, so trading assets within trust will have the one million exemption and then 50 percent relief thereafter. So it, it could be that um, it brings it into charge, but maybe a 3% charge every 10 years for, for assets in trust is, is, is um, something to be, uh, uh, I, guess, I, guess, I guess, put up with for the benefits that a trust um, might have. So we typically see them for asset protection, family succession purposes and so on. So still very much have their purpose in life. Um, for all those assets, the other assets which qualify for 50% relief, so this might be things like property you own personally but is used in your business, or it might be um, controlling shareholdings and listed shares and so on, that will just remain at the 50% relief going forward. Um, Anti-stalling measures I mentioned here. So what happens, so these, so these limits apply from the 6th of April 2026. So if you are standing here today, with assets which are fully qualified for 100% business relief and you die today or die before the 6th of April, that is exempted from inheritance tax. Similarly, if you were to gift that to a trust, for example, and it qualified for business relief, that would continue to apply. 
slightly anti forstalling comes in if you're to gift assets today but then die within seven years. So if you were to gift assets today, um, if they became a failed pet, i.e. vast, um, the relief would be based on the 1 million plus 50% exemption rather than total. Similarly, if you died or gone into trust, they ceased to qualify in the trust and, and, and so on, that would be it. So if you, if you transfer before 30th of April, should be the old rules, transfer before transfer on or after, full exemption until 6th of April, but anti forstalling if you're to die within seven years. Um, so the trust, the 1 million, so for trusts formed before the, um, uh, the, the 30th of October, will each have their 1 million exemption. For trusts formed on or after uh, the 30th of, uh, 30th of October, that 1 million will be shared amongst them. I've, I've referred to it broadly as connected trusts here, but trust by the same set law. This broadly stops someone with a value of 10 million business, obviously transferring 10% to 10 different trusts to try and make it about that way. Um, and then we're going to see a technical consultation, which commences early 2025. This will no doubt be on uh, administrative requirements, reporting requirements, and so on, as opposed to changes in the reliefs and exemptions themselves. But we'll wait to see further detail on that. Next slide, please. So yes, just other other measures. So again, the nil rate ban remains at three hundred twenty five thousand. Um, that has been frozen, extended. Was going to be frozen until twenty twenty eight. That's been extended until fifth of April twenty thirty. So an extra two years of that. So this kind of stealth tax, which will undoubtedly bring more estates into the realms of inheritance tax over the years. So the three two five has increased to five hundred thousand per individual, one million per couple. Uh, where the family home forms part of the estate, which goes to direct descendants. That hasn't changed. Other reliefs, exemptions, your 3K and an exemption, regular gifts out of income, that will stay same. The seven-year clock for, for um, uh, potentially exempt transfers and so on all remains. And then the other one, uh, I thought quite a big one there, we tucked away, but the residual pension pots as well. So from 6th of April 2027, so a bit of lead time on that. So pension pots, um, um, on, on death will now be subject to what well will be subject to inheritance tax at forty percent from the sixth of April twenty twenty seven. So I think that will be again whether people change their attitudes to pensions, whether they'll start um, you know spending things or or, or considering other options. We will see. Um, obviously, it can become incredibly expensive for for beneficiaries of those for people dying after the age of 75 their beneficiary will also pay income tax on drawing down those pensions so so 40 percent iht and 45 percent drawing income um are probably a, a, a good tool for um uh, provision for retirement uh, perhaps less uh, attractive for uh, or less useful for long-term inheritance tax planning moving on please so non-UK domiciles, so reforms confirmed. Um, there was a huge amount of detail here, so I probably won't do justice in, in the time we've got. Um, and uh, for those we will be running, we are running another um, dedicated uh, webinar um, Tuesday next week, where we're going to go to more detail on the, on the non-DOM changes, the capital gains and IHT changes and the carried interest changes, because um, there's a lot to mull over here. So yesterday we saw over 100 pages of draft legislation on these reforms. We saw over 30 pages of technical notes on these reforms and various case studies and so on. So there is a huge amount on a day, day uh, uh, to work through. There will be various pots of people impacted by these rules in different ways. Um, for those people who are already uh, deemed DOM, for those people who become deemed DOM before 5th of April, and for those new arrivers sort of after after 6th of April 2025. But broadly, sort of had and forth, there's been so much, so much kind of uh, you know, first announced in, in, in the Conservatives' uh, last, uh, last budget where they announced these reforms are coming. Replacing the non-DOM rule, which is sort of very archaic and looks at someone's central home, where, where is home, and sort of putting it on just a, a, a more statutory residency-based test to make it a bit clearer. Um, is the intention certainly going forward. So what this means, so new arrivals, so from 6th of April 2025, those who have not been in the UK for the past 10 years will benefit from this new FIG regime. So for the first four years, so all your income and gains offshore, 
generated offshore is completely free from UK tax. And that doesn't matter if you bring it into the UK or not. There's no remittance basis. It's just that then after your four years, you are taxed on a, uh, a rising basis like the rest of us. So, yes, yeah, so a new arrival um, that applies to people who've not been resident in the UK for 10 years. So interesting, I guess, on this residency test with non-DOM gone, I could potentially benefit from these rules. I've been in the UK all my life. I could perhaps go uh, uh, overseas for 10 years and then come back and then benefit from, from the FIG regime. Not that I have any wealth to be bothered doing that with, but um, just to show you um, how, how the rules have changed. There's also going to be a new temporary repatriation facility. So this was something announced by the Conservatives, which the Labour's have slightly extended for a third year. So this means those that are currently um, uh, sort of um, have unremitted foreign and income and gains. So unremitted foreign income and gains are rising up to the 5th of April 2025 for those remittance based users. They will have three windows, three years of opportunity to to well, I say bring those sort of funds into the UK and pay a beneficial rate of tax. They don't have to bring it into the UK, but they can nominate it as such. So in 25, 26 and 26, 27, there's going to be a 12% tax rate to bring in those unremated tax and e income and gains and 15% for the year after. So why, why um, it could be interesting. So remittances can take many different forms. So example, people might have... Um, uh, various assets overseas which have been acquired for, versus um, UK uh, versus acquired through non-UK source income and gains. Um, I might want to bring that beautiful painting to the UK once my mansion is 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 built, but that's four years off. So I might nominate to, to tax that um, in the, in the uh, 25, 26, for example, and then I can bring it over knowing my taxes are duly paid uh, when I choose to do so. So um, broadly, similar rules for foreign income and gains of, of, of non-UK settler interested trusts. So currently there is a, um, a, protected, a protected settlement regime, protected trust regime. So for those that became uh, deemed domicile um, in, in April 2017, provided they remain non-domicile as a matter of law, um, income and gains arising, in those offshore trusts were not taxed unless remitted. From April, uh, from 6th of April 2025, those, those income and gains will be taxed on a rising basis uh, for the set law when they're still alive. Obviously, if the set law is subject to the FIG regime, that applies. If they are UK resident and taxed, um, that, that applies equally. So this this FIG, this temporary repatriation facility can also apply to, to income and gains distributed from trusts. So there could be a, a window of opportunity there for pooled income and gains to be repatriated at, at perhaps uh, more beneficial rates than would otherwise be the case under the temporary repatriation facility. Um, current rebase, remittance base users, so non-UK CITUS assets can be rebased to 6 April 2017. I think we've got sort of uh, two or three different schools of people in there. So those that became deemed domicile on the 6th of April 2017 will have already had that uplifted, assuming, of course, they remain non-dom as a matter of domestic law. Um, and uh, those that uh, become deemed domicile from the 6th of April 25 and remittance-based users will similarly be able to rebase but back on you know, UK assets but dating back to April 2017. I think there might be a, a, a small pool of people within the 6 April 2017 and 6 April uh, 25 bunch who might not be able to qualify as remittance, but lots of details to work through there. And inheritance tax similarly moves to a residency based system. So what that will mean is the UK situated assets will always be subject to UK inheritance tax. Um, but once, but for people who've been outside the UK, uh, for 10 complete years should not be subject to UK inheritance tax on their non-UK situated assets. And then excluded property uh, trusts. So at the moment, say we have, we have a regime where people who've settled trust before they became deemed domicile offshore trust and the assets within there will always be excluded property from inheritance tax. 
Um, that is set to change. There's a huge amount of rules on this again in terms of transitional provisions, uh, whether uh, the, it will apply, whether the set law has since died or whether the set law is still alive, whether the set law becomes UK resident. If the settler is UK resident but ceases to be UK resident, there could be exit charges and so on. So, so a lot of detail there, a lot of things to work through, but um, in, a, in a heads up for 10 to 15 minutes that I have with you this morning. Um, there we go. So I think a whistle stop tour through some fundamental changes, but I shall now hand over to Caroline. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, a lot of food for thought there. Now, I promise we didn't collaborate on this in advance, but I'm going with the rule of three. So in yesterday's budget, there were three key themes for employers. First one was increased employment cost. The second is that where there are benefits that are seen to be um, promoted by government policy, there are savings available, which need to be thought about. And there are a number of changes and the tightening up of uh, compliance requirements to minimise tax leakage. So with the next slide, please, let's turn to the money raising um, measures that we expected. And first of all, let's look at um, NIC. The manifesto promised that there would be no increases to workers' income tax, no increase to workers' national insurance. But with a £22 billion black hole in public finances, the Chancellor was looking to other sources of funds to plug that hole. Now, if you're a physicist, you'll know that plugging a black hole is, is a tricky thing to do. And there have been numerous films trying to do exactly that. So uh, let's see if the Chancellor is our superhero. But let's think again, perhaps. But we'll look at what happens for the hole and the further spending promises. So in a move that is expected to raise 25 billion of the 40 billion tax increases, secondary class one, class 1A one and class 1B, so all employer national insurance contributions will go up by 1.2% to a roundish 15%. And that's going to apply from the 6th of April 2025. The secondary threshold is going down from £9,100 per annum to £5,000 per annum. Now, the impact of that is that it will bring in a lot of lower paid people into the employer's national insurance net. Particularly, we're going to be seeing part timers there. So people who otherwise wouldn't have been um, above the threshold because of the hours they worked and therefore the pay they received. They are now going to be caught. So what does this mean in terms of an actual cost? Well, on the 1st of October, the ONS gave us the latest um, average total pay figures. Now, that they're not exactly current. It's actually November 22. So the real figure is going to be higher than this. So bear with me. There are estimates here. But if we look at an average total pay of 32,708, that gives us an increase in employment cost through employers' national insurance of around about £900 per average employee on average total pay. Now, total pay includes bonuses. So that's a very significant amount. The employment allowance, which is now available for everyone because the restriction to employers paying less than 100,000 in NIC per year has gone away, that rises from 5,000 pounds to 10,500 pounds. So that's going to make a small impact, but really that's only going to be felt to any extent by the very smallest of employers. Things that remain exempt from employers NRC, NIC are employer pension contributions. And I know a lot of people will be relieved by that. And things like employee share awards over shares which are not readily convertible assets. So very broadly, shares in private companies or shares in companies that are listed on the stock exchange, but they're not close. Where there's no trading arrangements in place for those shares. So what we need to do is to have a look at how remuneration packages are structured and make best use of arrangements salaries, such as salary sacrifice or flexible benefits. And if you're not currently offering pensions through a flexible benefits or smart pensions or salary sacrifice arrangement, all different names for the same thing, then you need to think about it very carefully. So how do you go about that? And let's go on to the next slide to look at that. So we'll just canter through the rules on how to operate a salary sacrifice arrangement. Basically, the employee gives up some of their contractual salary and the timing of that um, 
giving up of the salary is absolutely crucial. You've got to get this right for the scheme to be effective. It's given up in exchange for the employer making a larger pension contribution for that employee. Both parties save national insurance. There is no national insurance, including employer's national insurance, on the pension contribution made by the employer. Now, the employer can retain that saving. It can pass it on to the employee in terms of a larger pension contribution. It can go towards funding the increased national insurance costs elsewhere, or it can share the saving between both parties. And there are other things that you could include as well, other NIC friendly arrangements, such as um, cycle to work schemes. And as, um, as we noted here, more staff may be interested as bus fares are going up. Um, or the um, other things to look at are very cost effective benefits, such as using electric vehicles as the base of your company car scheme. So. Let's have a look a little bit more detail for a second on electric vehicles. And I haven't got a, a separate slide on this, but the taxable benefits are significantly lower for an electric vehicle than from a traditionally fueled car. So the taxable benefit is calculated on the basis of something called the appropriate percentage. The appropriate percentage is going up and we've got figures announced through to 2029-30. The appropriate percentage for an electric vehicle is 9%. For a hybrid vehicle, it's something like 19%. But in 2930, a traditional car, the benefit will be based on a percentage of 39%. So that's a 30% difference between an electric vehicle and a traditionally fueled car. So that's something you should look at very carefully if you're considering what to do with your fleet or how to remunerate people cost effectively. So next slide, please. So NIC wasn't the only significant increase to employment costs. Um, we expected national minimum wage to go up. The recommendations of the Low Pay Commission were presented to government shortly before the budget, and the increases in NMW take account of the cost of living as they recommended. So we're looking at overall rate increases between 6.7% and an eye-watering at 17.97%. These are intended to bring the 18 to 20 rate towards um, the 21 and over rate. So basically, you'll have a rate for those under 18 or apprentices and a rate for everybody else, which will be the higher rate. So we're looking at increases of 17.97 for apprentices and those under 18 or apprentices over the age of 19 in their first year of apprenticeship. Um, for the under 18s, they don't tend to be full-time workers, they tend to have more limited hours. So will the rate have quite the impact that it would on a full-time worker? No, not necessarily. Um, but if those, those are full-time workers, it's going to be very significant. The 16.3% increase for the 18 to 20 year olds represents a £2,737 per annum rise for those in full-time work. And for somebody aged over 21, national minimum wage becomes £23,873.60 for a full-time worker, which is, as I said, a 6.7% increase. So that's going to be a significant burden across all sectors and for employers of all sizes, except for the very smallest. So let's have a look at other areas where government is looking to raise it's tax to take. Tax leakage is a big issue. And the government and HMRC view umbrella companies and the schemes that some of them are associated with as a major source of tax avoidance. So if you if you look on the HMRC page of spotlights, and spotlights are tax avoidance schemes that are likely to be under attack from HMRC, you'll see that an awful lot of them are associated with certain umbrella companies. However, equally, there are a number of um, umbrella companies, a large number of umbrella companies that are absolutely legitimate and they're a really useful team, um, sorry, a really useful method of employing temporary workers um, or part-time workers and they generally work through an agency arrangement. The new rules are just making sure that compliance is there, compliance is checked and the bottom line doesn't end up with the government having to go after um, umbrella companies, it's going to go after the agencies or the end users. So basically, if you are an agency using an umbrella company, then you are responsible for making sure that that umbrella company is accounting for and remitting PAYE rising on the payments to the worker 
through to HMRC. And if you don't, then it's going to end up with you as the agency. You're going to have to meet those liabilities. Where there isn't an agency, it doesn't stop there. So it's no good just going straight to the umbrella company if you're an end user. The responsibility will end with you as the end client. So in practice, what does this mean you're going to need to do? If you are an agency, get proof from the umbrella company that they are complying with their PAYE and the NIC requirements. And if you are an agency or an end user, then make sure that your supply chain due diligence is really, really rigorous. And there's loads of guidance out there as to what you need to do to be shown that you're using reasonable care and obviously get professional advice if you need some help on how to do that. So next slide, please, Jessica, thank you. The other area where we're looking at not increasing tax take, but bringing it forward is the payrolling of benefits. So this measure means that um, there will be payment of PAYE and class one national insurance on benefits in kind every pay interval. So is that monthly? Is it weekly? Is it um, at, a, at a more complicated, different pay interval, such as four weekly or 13 times per year? That's going to happen through the payroll rather than payment being made after the year end, um, generally in the first week of July through a PLMD or PLMDB. Now, some businesses obviously already payroll their benefits voluntarily and they do that through the full payment submission process. But from April 2026, when payrolling benefits is mandatory, more data is going to be required. Now, the government describes that as more granular we don't know exactly what that is yet. We need to wait and see. But I think that that is going to increase monthly administration for employers significantly because it's not just a case of working out what your benefit is on the first day of the tax year. Because who renews their medical benefits on the 6th of April? Not anybody I know. They generally do it around Christmas. So they might do it through the year. People are promoted at different times in the year so they get different entitlements to benefits. Our leases might run out during the year. People might have a child and therefore have a lifestyle event and change their benefit allowances. All of that needs to be taken into account and is going to be a significant burden for employers. One of the things that we raised on the focus groups when this was being put in place, and I was lucky enough to sit in on those, was that employment related loans and accommodation cannot currently be um, payrolled. It just the legislation is not there. It was announced yesterday that payrolling these benefits will be voluntary from 2026 um, to 27, but it will be mandatory in due course. So we're going to have to have some legislation to do that. So we wait that wait that with bated breath. For now, continue using PLMD or PL, and your PLMDBs for your Class 1A. Um, the value of benefits in kind can't always be ascertained. You might have a benefit that's provided by a third party provider, or you might get the data from an overseas headquarters, which means that um, you don't know what your benefit in kind value is during the course of the tax year. There will be an end of year process that you can use to adjust for this or to correct for any errors. Again, we're waiting the details. There will also be rules for special categories of workers, such as globally mobile employees. And guess what? We're still going to be waiting for the details for those as well. The technical specifications, and I think an awful lot of these other details too, are not going to be available until mid to late 2025. That really does not give much time for software developers to get everything in place to meet the requirements that are being set out for the new mandatory pay and revenue benefits. So to the extent that you can prepare, make sure that you educate your employees and make sure that you train your um, payroll team so that they can cope to the extent that is possible in as far as we know what we know now. So turning to the next slide, what other changes have we seen? So there are some other minor bits and pieces that we need to look at. Double cab vans going to be cars as a benefit in kind from April 2025. That makes perfect sense. I've talked about electric vehicles. We've got the Employment Rights Bill, which is going to bring in um, a number of key changes. Now, employment status, which was rumoured and promised um, before the Labour Party became the government, hasn't happened. And we're going to wait and see. And I'm not surprised about that because it's based on a complex raft of ever-changing case law. And we're having to face a rapidly evolving world of work. So putting that on statute books is going to be incredibly difficult. But what we do have is a day one right to claim unfair dismissal, subject to a nine-month probation period. 
a day one um, right to flexible working, which becomes the norm, which will be interesting in the context of making people come back to work five days a week. Um, and we have zero hours contracts becoming the choice of the employee um, who can instead choose guaranteed hours based on a 12 week reference period. EOTs and EBTs, the rules have been tightened, uh, but they still remain a very attractive way to sell a business from a CGT perspective. And Ben gave you a lot more information on that, so I won't cover it in any more detail. And the tax advantage employee share plans, so EMI, CSOP, SAYE and SIP, retain the beneficial CGT treatment. So the rates are, of course, going up in line with the other CGT rate increases, but they still generate significant savings. So I'm now going to hand over to Ed Gibson and Ed is going to explain the budget implications for business taxes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, so in contrast to what we've just heard from Caroline and Ben, when we're looking at business taxes, there isn't actually an awful lot uh, to talk about in terms of changes in the budget. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, the publication of the corporation tax roadmap is probably the headline from um, the business tax changes or business tax uh, in, uh, messages within the budget. However, um, I think it can quite easily be summarised in the key message at the top of the slide here, which is basically that nothing is changing. So there isn't actually anything in this corporate tax roadmap um, that's announcing any sort of change. It's basically confirming that things won't change. So um, key points there, headline rate um, has been capped at 25% and it does interestingly use the term capping rather than um, retaining a 25% rate which presumably opens up the option of lowering it. Um, interesting side point on that of course is um, if we think about the employer's NI increase, um, if they had tried to do similar through increasing the corporate tax rate, that would have resulted in an increase of around about 8%, which just gives you an idea of how significant those NI changes actually are for employers. Um, from a capital allowances perspective, um, they have confirmed that the full expensing regime will be retained for uh, the length of this parliament, which is obviously good news. Um, similarly, um, announced no, no significant changes to any of the incentives regime, so R&D, uh, land remediation relief and um, the various uh, film credits uh, etc they're all staying pretty much uh, as they are uh, and then finally for larger businesses um, reaffirms uh, the government's commitment to uh, implementing pillar one and pillar two um, there were some mildly interesting comments in there around transfer pricing albeit most of those have already been uh, pre-announced so for example uh, the possibility of dropping uh, uk uk transfer pricing rules um, and some comments around potentially lowering the thresholds at which transfer pricing uh, kicks in. Um, the one thing in there that was um, relatively uh, relatively new, I guess, was there was a comment that they would like to give, um, they want to put in place a new process that could give certainty uh, for investors in major projects, which if it goes through would obviously be a positive thing, um, but otherwise, um, pretty much uh, as is, I think, is the key message from this corporation tax roadmap. Uh, if we move on to the next slide. Uh, business rates, uh, a little bit more here. Um, so they announced an intention to introduce a permanently lower multiplier for retail, hospitality and leisure businesses, which will kick in from 2026-27. Um, that will be funded sustainably via higher multipliers on properties with a rateable value over 500,000. Uh, there was an announcement of an interim measure to support uh, businesses in the RHL sector through 40% relief in 25-26, which has been capped at 110,000 per business. Uh, so that's good news for those businesses that that is in place. Uh, and also that smaller business will be protected by freezing the small business multiplier for 25, 2026. 20, um, the, there was a document released uh, that indicated a commitment to further reform of business rates, albeit relatively light on any sort of detail uh, on that. And the bit, of, the bit of information stroke detail that was in there did not point towards a particularly major reform. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if that develops into anything more substantial in due course. We move on to the next slide, please. 
in terms of other measures, um, so again, pillar two, uh, there was uh, an announcement of a multitude of legislative changes in connection with uh, pillar two. Um, pretty much all of these uh, seem to be related to the latest set of administrative guidance that was released by the OECD a few months ago now that had not yet been legislated, uh, but there may also be some additional detailed changes in there as well. Um, there was a confirmation that uh, previously announced uh, changes to the audiovisual expenditure credit um, for businesses um, uh, who are uh, engaged in visual effects in the UK. Uh, so they were all pre-announced earlier in the year. It's been confirmed that they will go through following a consultation. Um, the offshore receipts in respect of intangible property rules, uh, fondly known as ORIP, uh, they will be repealed from the 31st of December this year, which again was something that had been pre-announced, so not really uh, anything new there. And then the final point on here is just that there were some changes announced to the energy profits uh, levy, uh, broadly to increase the rate of that uh, by 3% for those businesses affected, uh, and also withdrawing um, part of the investment allowance that was previously available uh, within that. Uh, so we move on. Uh, that is that is basically a, a run through of the key business tax changes. So I promised that would be a short and indeed it was. Uh, we'll now pass over to Aditi, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, indirect tax changes. Thank you so much, Ed, and good morning, everybody. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. No massive surprises or shocks in VAT. The government still intends to continue with its plan to tax private school education. What that means is supplies of education, vocational training, boarding, lodging, everything in terms of supplies by the private school will be caught. But they have also made some concessions. So any education at nursery classes, further education, higher education, and also courses on teaching uh, English as a foreign language, um, those supplies will still remain VAT exempt. Um, there has been a lot of lobbying in this area. Um, however, we were expecting some relief for faith schools, international schools, um, children of military personnel. However, those, unfortunately, those changes haven't quite made it through. So um, supplies in that area will also be taxed, although there will be some government funding for military personnel. Um, by taxing supplies of private education, it does mean that schools should now think about registering for VAT and also um, that gives them some opportunities on unlocking VAT recovery which could potentially help save on costs. Uber, so probably heard a lot about Uber and the VAT treatment of their services. So following the litigation that's happened in this area, the government has done a consultation to implement a VAT regime that is simplified and more practical. So the government has confirmed that it will respond to the consultation that it had raised. Next slide, please. Thank you. Carbon border adjustment mechanism. There was some speculation that perhaps this might not be high on the Labour's agenda, but it has been very much confirmed that the um, CBAM will be introduced from 1st Jan 27. It will be on very selected products that are identified at high risk of carbon leakage. Um, we've also heard that uh, there will be a constant review of the items on the list. So this will really impact businesses who are importing such products. So it's just keeping an eye on what the final legislation looks like and managing your compliance obligations. Final slide, please. Um, vaping products. So this is a new duty that has been um, introduced. It will apply to vaping products and there is going to be a flat rate. 
the government has also announced reforms for remote gambling duty and the good news is that fuel duty is frozen and uh, there has been a 5p cut so that's still going to stay for a longer while i did say final slide but this was my penultimate slide so can i have my actual final final slide please thank you and there have been a range of hikes across other indirect taxes um these are on your slide but in effect they are being increased in line with inflation so lots going on in terms of other indirect taxes VAT no massive shocks or surprises um yeah the next step is keeping an eye on the finance bill so that's where we'll see a lot more detail of the plans that have been coming out um that's it from my side i will now hand over to david thank you very much aditi well look it is just about past the hour so let me just say what's going to happen next we have um the fat end of 100 or so questions that you've posed as we've been through this. Um, what I think we'll do is rather than keep you here till quarter to two, is we'll group some of those things thematically um, and just make sure that we uh, we let you have some thoughts taking into account what you have specifically asked. So we have them all here captured. Please do not think we're not going to cover them. But by equal turn, um, it's quite important that we end on time. So let me just do this to close. Um, First of all, I would like to thank all of our speakers for the time and effort they have put in to put their content together. Um, if we could flick on to the next slide, just to make sure I get this covered for you. I'd also like to do a shameless plug for a couple of things we have coming up. So ultimately, we have uh, a session for professional services organisations on the 7th of November, which is a tax update for them, which will obviously have some specific thoughts on how this budget has impacted those. We have our standard on top of tax session on the 20th of November, uh, again, which will be looking um, at some of the stuff that we've covered today. Um, and for all intents and purposes, two things useful and very important, I think, a session from our Workplace Evolution series of seminars, which looks at employee cost efficiency. Uh, boy, does that ever not need looking at now on the premise that we have uh, all manner of things going on with employer Nick, apprenticeship levy and so on and so forth. And a really interesting session on the 5th of November for um, looking at tax in the CFO. So ultimately covering tax aspects that hit a CEO's agenda and what's important to them. Please do um, register for what uh, is important to you. Uh, it would be lovely to see you there. Our on top of tax session is a super, it's a super, super series of events that we put on. So it would be lovely uh, to you, uh, for you to get the most from them. Um, please do so. Um, and then uh, if I could say thank you very much for joining. There is one final little poll that we've put there for you. It just helps us capture what's important to you as we go through these things. And um, please do tick accordingly. And I think it just remains for me to say, uh, we'll publish some things around the Q&As in due course. We'll send around a recording of the session and a copy of the slides as we've sent to you a note around already. And if you've got any questions, just let us know. You can see our details on that final slide there. Three minutes past 11. I hope that's not too late for you. Thank you very much for joining and we'll see you soon.